today on Florida Sportsman, Project Dreamboat. The experts at TRB dive back into the Skimmer Skiff project with some very custom details in mind. I'm looking forward to getting this hardware and having a go at Cerakoting it and putting it back on the boat and see what it looks like. FS boating editor George Labonte joins Randy Orr aboard his tricked out 18 foot Maverick. The combination of plenty of space to fish on, a great performing hull and a classic look made this Master Wrangler a perfect candidate for a restoration. The technicians at Rocky Point Boatworks provide oil change know-how while performing a Suzuki outboard 100 hour service. Make sure you put your dipstick back in after checking. Make sure your oil fill caps on and tight and put your oil filter on, but don't over tighten it. And the team at Wildfire Marine installs a custom Armstrong bracket on the Bertram 25 project. Brackets have a real good advantage uh, in the main one, especially on a boat like this, is the amount of cockpit space that, the, uh, that Dave's gonna gain. Probably about 35% more space than he had in the boat before. All coming up on Florida Sportsman, Project Dreamboat. Join us as we follow one-off builds to all-out restorations in Stewart, Florida's Dreamboat District, home to some of the best custom boat builders in the world. From modest to over-the-top, industry experts from the district's premier facilities show how it's done. Fiberglass repair, custom paintwork, engine rigging, electronics installations, and more. And boating editor George Labonte shares the stories of boaters who have already turned their dreams into reality. This is Florida Sportsman Project Dreamboat. Yeah, TRB, we recently did a, a skimmer skiff for best boat, and now we're doing our second one. I'm really excited with the progress on this boat. Uh, the dash panel's done, the guys have got some of the plumbing work in, they've got some of the electrical stuff, I've seen some of the stereo stuff going in. Royce has removed all the deck hardware and I've just got it back in my booth and I'm about to start prepping it for Cerakoting. Now Cerakoting is a ceramic coating that we bake onto hardware. It's incredibly tough. We like it because we can take a stainless steel fitting and we can make it virtually any color we want. But this particular set of deck hardware we do in a, in a matte black or a satin black to match the rest of the boat. After we've washed the product, it's really important that you never touch it with a bare hand. So we put a pair of uh, nitrile gloves on, we move it over to the sandblast cabinet. Inside the sandblast cabinet, we have an aluminum oxide set to a specific grit to get the type of finish that we need. Sandblasting is really important because this is going to be what gives a key for the Cerakote to stick to. So once we've sandblasted everything, there's often a bit of grit that sticks to it. We've also got to make sure that there's no contaminants in the sand. So it goes back into the acetone for half an hour again, and from there it goes to the oven. By baking it off, it often allows some of the stuff to evaporate, especially the chemicals. Once we've done with the initial bake, we inspect everything. It is then put into the little spray booth to get ready for the Cerakote process. So when you mix in Cerakote, the ratio of product to catalyst dictates the finish that you get. So if you're wanting a, a more of a glossy finish, you use less catalyst. By adding more catalyst, you'll go from a satin to a matte finish. We wanted to go for a satin finish on this, so I then mixed the catalyst to the ratio that I needed, and I believe it was like 18 to one. When you are laying Cerakote down, a big mistake a lot of people make is they either put too little, in other words, they put a dry coat down, which means that when you spray it, um, your paint is almost drying before it gets to the product. And the second mistake people make is they put too much product on. So it's really important that you learn to spray Cerakote to the correct mold thickness. 
I spray them my parts in batches and then I load them into the oven. Once they're all loaded in the oven, I then have a period of time that I need to bake the products off for. The specific time is metal products are baked at 300 for an hour. Let them cool down and um, I like to leave them until the next day before I take them out of the oven. If I have to take them out of the oven, I like to leave them hanging. I, I kind of have a feeling that if you give them sort of a good 24 hours before you mess with them, it's just a little better. Like anything that you do, um, you always feel you can do better. But I definitely think that um, bar one or two parts, they came out great. The, the project, the whole project is moving along really, really well at the moment. We've got a bunch of parts arriving this week and it's going to be great to have everything together, have a good look at the boat, go and do a sea trial and see how the boat performs. When we come back, George Labonte joins Dreamboat owner Randy Orr aboard his tricked out 18 foot Maverick in this week's One Man's Dreamboat segment. This segment brought to you by Fiberglass Coatings, the largest selection of fiberglass materials in the United States. FGCI is a leading supplier of composite materials, family owned for over 60 years and headquartered right here in Florida. We have the materials and technical expertise to service manufacturers, repair professionals, and DIYers alike. Our gel coat color matching is a favorite of seasoned professionals and weekend warriors. Access our online store at FGCI.com, call to speak with a product specialist, or visit our stores in Fort Lauderdale or St. Petersburg. FGCI is your partner on boat projects big and small. Welcome back to Florida Sportsman Project Dreamboat. Join us for this week's One Man's Dreamboat segment with Florida Sportsman Boating Editor George Labonte as we feature anglers who have already launched their dream. Florida Sportsman began these features 30 years ago and the dreams just keep getting better. Boat restoration projects aren't for the faint of heart. A lot of times somebody takes on a project and they decide immediately when they finish it that they never want to do that again. On the other hand, a lot of people take on a project and it consumes them. They often find themselves in the position where they can't wait to start another project. And that's exactly where we land today. We're gonna join Randy Orr today. Randy is actually the producer of the show, Chris Collins' his father, and you might remember him from a project they did last year, the 20-foot Seacraft. Well, after they wrapped up that Seacraft, Randy hadn't had enough, so he took on a beautiful 18-foot Maverick Master Angler project that I know you're gonna love. All right, so when I first bought the boat, I just got over doing the Seacraft project, and I tell you, I was just wanted to buy a boat and fish it for as long as I possibly could. I get the boat home, and I take it out for a sea trial, and it worked great. I stopped by a friend of mine's shop, and he told me that I had the wrong shaft for the boat. Right away, I said, find me a motor. That afternoon, he called me up, found me a 20-inch shaft motor, and I tore the Johnson off of it that night and had the Mercury on late in the evening. Being the person that I am, I started the whole project from top to bottom. I never fished it, not one day. So a couple days later, I had the motor off, I found some colors, and I picked this awesome color out from a paint chip called Cheerful Tangerine, and I had a friend of mine make a custom all grip color with it, and it just started from there. It tore everything off, down to the bare bones, Started grinding, sanding, and prepping for paint. That took about maybe two weeks. I had the boat top sides done. The third week I had the paint on the boat, and I finally found a console down at Bird's All, an old Maverick console, and I modified it for my electronics. And the position of the steering wheel was up top. It was very awkward. So for me, having a new console was the way to go, and I had to modify it to get exactly what I wanted. And the end result is, is I built this awesome console and I should have made a mold off of it and I could be selling these things right now because everybody loves it. And then I got to thinking, all right, I don't want to sit the whole time. It was uncomfortable driving the boat fast standing. So I searched online and I found myself some flip up bolsters, they're called them. The seats themselves, they're awesome. You sit them down, you can flat out, go fast, feel comfortable, like you're not going to fly out of the boat. Or you can flip the bolster up, get a good bird's eye view while you're out looking for fish rolling or something like that. Helps your angle, helps you steer better. Everything about those seats is exactly what I wanted in a seat. After I was finished with the console, I went over to Dave at Rocky Point Boatworks. I brought him my design and my layout and he made me a banging 
Lexan panel for the face of this boat. Everything is flush mounted, looks great, backlit, couldn't ask for a better product. So as much as I like to fish, I really like to go out and enjoy boats, drink beer and listen to loud music. Hanging out with my friends at the sandbar is what I really enjoy the most. So I put this stereo system in there. I did some research. I wanted some tower speakers back on my polling platform, some eight, eight, some eight inch speakers up at the front, big subwoofer, and I hooked up with a JBL system and it's absolutely fantastic. I pull up to the sandbar and everybody's head turns because they can't help but hear me coming. Now that I've rebuilt this entire boat, I had to have a way to get it up to the sandbar without beaching it. So the best thing to do was buy a set of talons, throw them on there. I'm three foot off the shore. I drop them, jump off the bow, boat sticks. I don't get a scratch on the bottom. We used a taco rub rail on our other boat and I loved it. It looks great, it's clean, it shines up nice. So I went ahead and decided to do it again on this boat. But this time I added in the nav lights up in the front, built into the rub rail. Super clean, tight look. Took away where I could mount my trolling motor up there without having to block my older style navigation lights. End result is super clean, I love it. Randy's attention to detail was evident all over this project. From the things you could see, such as the custom console, the paintwork, and the layout of the boat, to the things that you couldn't see, such as the actuators under the seat, the wiring in the console, and the charging system for the trolling motor. So obviously the boat kind of reminds you of Orange Sherbert. So in America, everybody says Sherbert, and I looked it up and found out the correct spelling. So I kind of did a pun on words or a play on words and I called it Sherbet. So not only did I call it Sherbet with the orange, but it's a Sherbet. And I placed the name on the side where people would question on who actually manufactures the boat. Some people would ask, is it a Sherbet? Who makes it? As we were out filming for the show, my son used the Seacraft, his boat, for filming. And we filmed our boats together. Was, what a great feeling. Looking over at a boat I just completed, and he's on it, and now I'm on a boat that I just completed that's mine. And it's no better feeling to see him smiling and me smiling, it was just great. The only thing I didn't like about it is he still is faster than me. After spending the morning with Randy, I know for sure he's gonna have a lot of fun on this Maverick until the inevitable next project comes along. In the interim, I was sure to give him a couple of products from our friends at Surehold to make sure he can keep this project looking her best. The combination of plenty of space to fish on, a great performing hull, and a classic look made this Master Wrangler a perfect candidate for a restoration. After an initial investment of $7,000 and spending $18,000 on repairs and custom modifications, the cost of Randy's dream boat comes to a total of $25,000. When we return, the team at Rocky Point Boatworks reviews the basics of a proper outboard oil change. This segment brought to you by Pacer Group, marine grade electrical wire, components and systems. For more than 30 years, Pacer Group has been the most trusted provider of wire, cable, and electrical products to the top marine manufacturers. All of our wire and cable is made in the USA to ensure it's the best in the industry. Pacer Group provides the highest quality electrical products to be found at one place. You can order with us at pacergroup.net. Shop online and ship or pick up your web order within an hour at our Hollywood, Florida location. Welcome back to Florida Sportsman, Project Dream Boat. Join us as the team at Rocky Point Boatworks gives important tips and tricks on how to properly change your outboard oil. So here on our Suzuki 100-hour service, we've already taken care of the water pump, gear oil, and spark plugs, and now we're moving on to the oil change. This is important because these motors run at a high RPM a lot of times, and uh, they break down all the stuff that's in the oil which could cause uh, premature bearing failure and those type of things. First thing we're gonna do while performing our oil change is remove the oil filter. Sometimes you wanna use an oil filter wrench. This kind of adjusts to different sizes. So um, for me, it works well. It fits in the, in the spot nice. Um, so we already had gotten loose. We're gonna unthread it. Lucky for me, no oil drip anywhere. They come with a little protective plastic on there. Kind of important to make sure that that comes off. We're gonna put a little grease on there. You can use motor oil, whatever, silicone spray. 
just a little bit. So we'll go ahead and definitely thread it on by hand. Once you feel it seat, uh, my hands are a little slippery, so I'm gonna use a rag to help me out. I just wanna get like a quarter turn. You don't wanna go too crazy. Next part of our services, we're gonna go ahead and take these anodes out. It comes in the kit, so we're gonna go ahead and put them on. Hey Dave, how's it going? Hey, pretty good. You gonna drain the motor oil? I think I will. All right. So now we're gonna move on to the oil change. This is my end of it. This is the part just gets messy. We're gonna pop the, the drain plug out. I use a bucket with a funnel. You do your method. All right, a real trick, now that we've broken this, this uh, drain bolt loose, is not to make a mess. Good luck. While Mark's doing that also, this right here on a Suzuki, is where you would put your hose when you come home. It's a, or if you're on a lift, there's something they put on the new ones. They put them on the front so that you can rinse out your motor at the end of the day. And I can't stress enough: do not run your motor while this is attached. You will waste. You will melt your water pump housing. What will happen? You will melt your water pump housing, and then you will have serious issues. So when you drain your oil, you should take notes and look at your oil. You don't want to see anything metallic inside your oil or anything that looks like a milkshake, like a chocolate milkshake. These show us signs of water intrusions for the milkshake, and the metallic shows us signs of metal wear. So we're always looking for these type of items when we're changing our oil. Now that we've drained our oil, everything looks good, we're gonna refill our oil. Now this oil doesn't come with the maintenance kit, but it is Suzuki oil. We like to use the manufacturer's recommended oil because it's better for you in the long run when you have warranty, and we know this oil especially formulated for your motor. All right, now we're gonna fill the oil. Make sure you have a clean funnel. Why is that important, Mark? Why? Because some smart ass might ask you why it's important. No, really, why? It's because we don't want to put contaminants in our oil. Oil is what makes the world go around. What if there was a piece of foil from when you opened the oil container? Don't worry about it. The oil pump will suck it up, block it off, and you'll just starve the motor for oil. Give oh. me a jug, would you? I install one full gallon. Now, I do not install two gallons because the motor takes roughly two gallons, but I want to double check it. I'll, I'll put a gallon and a half in the second, and then I will check the dipstick and see where I need to go from there. So now we have about seven quarts in this motor. It holds about eight. So we're going to double check, make sure we're on the right track. Pull the dipstick out, wipe it clean. Insert, hold, pull. As you can see, we want to be between this dot and this dot. We're in a safe level, but I prefer mine to the upper end. So I'm going to add the rest of the motor oil. Like they always say, good to the last drop. Now that we've added our last bit of oil, we're going to recheck. And you can see our lower dots here, our upper dots here, we're about three quarters of the way up. That's right where we want to be at. We're going to call it good. Now that we're all done with this oil change, Dave, what's next? Fuel filters. We're going to show you how to inspect and service your fuel system and wrap up your service. When we return, the experts at Wildfire Marine upgrade the Bertram 25 with a brand new engine bracket. This segment brought to you by Suzuki Marine, the ultimate outboard motor. to suzukimarine.com to find a dealer near you. Welcome back to Florida Sportsman, Project Dreamboat. Join us as experts at Wildfire Marine continue the I.O. conversion on the Bertram Project by bolting on a new Armstrong bracket. Here at Wildfire Marine, we're working on Dave's, Dave Taylor's 25-foot Bertram I.O. conversion. And we've got our transom done, we've got all of our seats done, and we've got a phone call from Armstrong that our bracket's ready, so we went down and picked that up, and we're gonna get ready to bolt that on the back of the boat now. We set the bracket up against the boat so we could mark our holes, and then uh, once we drilled them all, we realized that the bolts for the center portion of the bracket 
weren't going to be long enough because of the additional plywood that we put on there and the extra layers of bioxyl glass. So we called Armstrong to see if they had the longer bolts and uh, Debbie's going to go down there and pick those up for us so we can go ahead and get this bracket done. As close as uh, Armstrong is, about 100 feet away from us. And uh, when we go down, Carlos is the boss. Everybody runs to her, asks her what she needs. <laughs> I'm only the person that carries everything. The people down there are awesome. I mean, you ask them a question. If they don't know it, they'll find it for me. And they gave me what I needed. And she's the one that pays the bills. She hands them the check. And they smile at her. Now that Debbie got back with the bolts, we're going to go ahead and bolt this bracket on. Uh, and it's pretty easy installation because there's only one way this bracket can go on. Because of the fact that it's got this bump out and then tapered ends, uh, we had to do a template for it. And so once Armstrong built that bracket, that's exactly where that, bolt, that bracket's going to go. So we put it up to the boat and it's going to be perfect. Once we have the bracket dry fitted and we're ready to put it on for good, we go ahead and put uh, 3M. I don't use 5200 anymore because it, it kind of yellows, but we use 4000, which is basically the same material. And we go ahead and put a, a, a bead around the entire outside perimeter on the inside perimeter. And then we do a circle around every one of the bolt holes in the, in the bottom of the tub. And then we do a third bead across the whole bottom so that we have plenty of sealant everywhere. So once we start to suck this thing up, uh, there's no way it's coming off and there's no way it's going to leak. One good thing about I.O. conversions is the amount of space that Debbie has to work with on the inside. Uh, usually she has to reach through all kinds of hatch openings or down through other places and, or crawl down on the bills. This thing here, she can just sit there and she's got access to every single bolt right from the center of the boat. She can reach any direction. Uh, so I.O.s are very nice jobs to get for a bracket installation. Everything is completely open. Brackets have a real good advantage uh, in the main one, especially on a boat like this, is the amount of cockpit space that, the, uh, that Dave's going to gain. Uh, a twin engine box configuration really takes up a ton of deck space. And now that that's eliminated and we have a flat deck, uh, he's got probably about 35% more space than he had in the boat before. Before we go any further on the inside of the boat, we're going to go ahead and, and start working on our wiring because we need to have that done for for Dave down at Coastal. And also we want to get a, a lot of this stuff done before we can start putting side panels in. And we can't put any of our seating in without having the side panels in. So we need to get working on our wiring. Next week on Florida Sportsman, Project Dream Boat. The team at Rocky Point Boatworks completes their 100 hour Suzuki service with fresh fuel filters and more. At TRB Customs, Dale tackles the daunting task of painting faux wood on the Hydra step. And George Labonte joins Kyle Durgin aboard his custom 1973 Prowler.